so uh, the first and the first talk it turned turned out that Galois conjugates of uh, of the stretch factors uh, played a role in determining whether a pseudo mapping class is coming from Penner's construction or not. So it, uh, it makes sense to consider where these Galois conjugates might lie in the complex plane. So uh, one, uh, well, one thing I proved is that these uh, stretch factors coming from Penner's construction never have Galois conjugates in the unit circle. So one, um, one theorem that I won't be able to prove, but I would like to give the idea behind the proof, is that these Galois conjugates can be dense in the, in the complex plane. Um, and uh, for this, I can fix my surface, but I need to change my, my multi-curves. Um, the other uh, thing that I want to talk about, and it's, it's basically the same, uh, same proof or same techniques, is uh, um, the algebraic degrees, possible algebraic degrees of the stretch factor. So let me tell you something about what's known about, uh, well, so first, first of all, what's known in general about stretch factors. So there is a conjecture that, uh, that a real number greater than 1 is a pseudonymous of stretch vector um, if and only if um, uh, so if and only if lambda is an algebraic unit and all Galois conjugates of lambda except 1 over lambda lie in, in this annulus. So, uh, so this is 1. This is lambda. This is 1 over lambda. And oops. So every other every Galois conjugate of lambda um, lies in this annulus, in the in the open annulus. Um, it's well this this direction is uh, is uh, is known. The other direction is is, is the one that's hard. <coughs> Yeah, that might not be conjugate to 1 over lambda s square. So what's known about the degrees? So well, first and proved So what's the degree of lambda? Lambda is an algebraic integer, so it has some minimal polynomial. So the degree of lambda is just the degree of that minimal polynomial. So, so the degree of lambda is at most uh, the dimension of the Teichmuller space of S, where S, well, so it's real dimension, and uh, and lambda is some stretch factor on the surface S. Um, so, um, in particular, um, it's six uh, G minus six for for the closed surface of genus G, and uh, so this this is in the seventies. And then uh, Arnu and Yoko's um, in, uh, in 81, they gave examples that showed that, uh, um, that, this, that the maximum degree of lambda uh, is at least g, uh, still. Uh, Still far away from six G minus six, but at least this one is uh, um, increasing linearly with the genus. Um, and uh, very recently, uh, Sheen um, showed that um, while well, the maximum degree uh, is at least two uh, G. Well, so you can also 
consider um, pseudo-NSOFs with uh, orientable, stable, and unstable foliations. And in that case, um, so let's say it's, I denote it with a, with a plus. So if lambda is a stretch factor of such an orientable pseudo-NSOF map, then there is a smaller bound 2j because then the stretch factor is the eigenvalue of the action on homology, which has 2g dimensional. And so what Sheen actually proved is that the, uh, uh, that in the orientable case, uh, this theoretical maximum 2g is actually realized. That, yeah. Um, so, um, so uh, the main question, what I was thinking about, is whether this 6g minus 6, or how can you realize this 6g minus 6 maximum degree, which Thurston claims in one of his papers that it's possible, but he doesn't prove it. Um, and. Uh, it turns out that uh, that all even degrees um, at most the dimension of the tectonic space um, can be realized. So th this is the other uh, theorem that I want to talk about today. Um, well, it's worth mentioning uh, um, what's going on for odd degrees. So it's, uh, it's uh, well, basically nothing is known. Only, well, OK, it, one thing is known. Uh, it's due to long that uh, if, if the degree of uh, lambda is odd, then that the degree is at most half of the tectonic space, dimension of the tectonic space. Um, uh, no, not. There's no punctured surfaces as well, um, but orientable surfaces. Um, um, yeah. Um, so, so this is this is some simple fact. Uh, basically, the idea is that when the degree is odd, then lambda and one over lambda are not Galois conjugates. So, um, so lambda and one over lambda have different minimal polynomials, and that causes the degree to go uh, at most half the, the the possible maximum degree. Um, so the question, the open question, is. Do all degrees? Um, do all odd degrees at most this bound arise? And I should say that uh, that uh, Sheen did some computer experiments, and, and he found lots of examples for. Uh, in lots of cases, but he did not find degree five example on the closed surface of genus three, which which is uh, allowed uh, by this bound. Um, and the other thing I uh, I want to say that this question. Not this question. Uh, this question is uh, related to the question is a uh, question about what are the possible degrees that arise for non-orientable surfaces. For instance, these Onuyoko's examples come from pseudonyms of some non-orientable surfaces, and well, they construct degree G example in. Uh, Genus G. So if the genus is odd, they construct odd degree examples in particular. Um, so uh, um, if if anyone is interested in 
looking at this question, then this question is also interesting. So what are the possible degrees for S non-orientable? So the first question that, that is interesting is um, if you look at the, the genus for non-orientable surface, does this degree 5 rise as, um, as a degree of a stretch factor? All right, so that's, uh, that's the, the history. And let me just say one. Uh, or maybe two pieces of motivations why you might care about the degree. So there's a result of uh, Franks and Ricken, um, also related result by Gutkin, Judge, um, saying that that degree of if the degree is two, that the same thing as saying that uh, that the sudden loss of um, arises um, from from an unassolved map on the torus by branch covering. Right, so here is some algebraic complexity of the pseudon Ossov map, and here is some geometric complexity of the map, which are connected. So it would be also really interesting to say something about higher, like what, what can I say about the geometric complexity of a pseudon Ossov map if the degree is not maximal, but like four? Is it, in what sense is, is the pseudon Ossov map simple in that case? Uh, another possible, uh, uh, connection is uh, is that uh, if you have a pseudo loss of map, then the stable and unstable foliations define a flat surface, which has a which has a trace field, and the trace field is Q adjoin uh, lambda plus one over lambda, and so um, uh, it's an interesting question. What 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 are what are the trace fields that um, Right. Given a surface, what are the trace fields that arise from all, all the pseudonyms of maps on that surface? And so, so the degree of of this number field is uh, well, it's it's either the degree of of lambda or 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 half of the degree of of, of lambda. So. Uh, in particular, um, um, in particular, th this theorem, um, also the methods, um, Im imply that all uh, the possible degrees of the trace fields include everything from one to one half the dimension of the technical space. All right, so let me. Um, Okay, let me say that basically there are two parts of of the proofs of both theorems. The first first part is uh, is a technique for showing that the polynomial is irreducible, or at least showing that a polynomial factors into irreducible factors in a certain way, because because we want to say something about the degree of of, of a minimal polynomial. Um, and the second thing is we need to construct these pseudo of examples that give us these polynomials that we can um, uh, study using these irreducibility criteriums. So let me begin with the irreducibility criterion. So, so the first problem is uh, irreducibility. So 
So one thing why irreducibility is uh, um, is complicated in the pseudo setting is that all polynomials are have constant coefficient monic and have constant coefficient plus minus one. Um, so you can so the simple irreducibility irreducibility criteria like this mod p Eisenstein criteria don't apply. Um, so, uh, so the um, here is a simplest version of uh, of the irreducibility lemma that I use. Um, so we consider a sequence of uh, integral polynomials with the same degree. So degree two r. Monic and uh, <coughs> reciprocal. So these are the typical polynomials that appear. Uh, monic and reciprocal. And <coughs> suppose that there is a sequence of of Roots a lambda k going to infinity. So lambda k is a root of pk. <coughs> and also, suppose that that one is never a root of any of these polynomials. And also, suppose that pk x divided by x minus lambda k over x minus 1 over lambda k. Right, so lambda k is a root. It's reciprocal. So 1 over lambda k is also a root. So you can divide by these two factors, and you still get a polynomial, uh, not necessarily integral coefficients. But then I require that this polynomial converges to x minus 1 to the 2r minus 2. So I require that all the roots converge to 1, in other words. So under these assumptions, uh, then the statement is that pkx is irreducible uh, if k is um, large enough. Eventually, these polynomials become irreducible. But the proof is elementary. So the first observation is that um, well, so these polynomials have a constant, well, these are money can have constant coefficient plus minus 1. So if you, if you factor it to irreducible factors, then all factors have um, leading and and constant coefficient plus minus one. Um, so therefore, uh, for each factor, the products of the roots of that factor is plus or minus one. So the products of roots in each factor is plus minus 1. So then uh, what happens with lambda k and 1 over lambda k? So if, say if lambda k and 1 over lambda k are different, different factors for infinitely many, infinitely many k, then every other root is converging to 1. So there's going to be a factor where one, like one root is going to infinity, everything else is going to one, which means that the constant coefficient can be plus minus one. So it follows that lambda k and one over lambda k are eventually, uh, eventually in the same factor. In the same factor. Okay, so if if 
if still infinitely many of these polynomials are reducible, then we can choose a subsequence where those factors that do not have these as roots, uh, well, that sequence of, in that sequence of polynomials, all the roots are converging to 1. Okay, so if the roots are converging to 1 and these are integral polynomials, then the coefficients also converge to the coefficients of the limit, which is a, a power of this. But we are talking about convergence of integral polynomials, so the sequence is eventually constant. Which means that eventually 1 is a root of these polynomials that is impossible. So, uh, uh, so eventually, um, uh, well, well, eventually x minus 1 to some power is a factor. It, it becomes a factor which is a contradiction. Okay, so um, this is the simplest version of the lemma. You can, you, you don't have to require that one is not a root of these guys. You can also say that that you allow one to be a root of multiplicity four for for all of these, and then by the same argument you also so from the same argument you get that okay, there's always an x minus. 1 to the 4 factor, but the rest, uh, the remaining thing must be reducible. So, um, so when constructing different degrees, uh, this is how you get the intermediate degrees. That you, you, you control how many times 1 is, is the root of the polynomial. All right. So, uh, Um, okay, now I'm going to talk about the the second problem, which is constructing pseudonyms of examples that that give us these um, sequences of polynomials. So um, I'm going to do this Penders construction again. So, um, so recall that we, we have uh, a pair of multicurves A and B. And uh, so omega is the intersection matrix. And I'm going to call this, um, this submatrix X. <coughs> so this submatrix is going to be X transpose. <coughs> Um, um, all right, so so note the first, note the following thing. So there are there are two degrees of freedom. In uh, <coughs> in Penner's construction, well, the first degree of freedom is uh, well, it's choosing choosing your pair of multi curves. That's one thing you can choose. The other thing you can choose is uh, choosing uh, the product um, product of the twists. So we are going to construct sequences. So the first maybe natural idea would be to fix a pair of multi-curves and just vary the product in, in a certain way. In fact, we're going to do the opposite. So we are, um, we're going to fix the product um, 
and change the multi-curves. So first, it, it seems like it doesn't make sense because how can I fix the product if I'm choosing the underlying curves? Well, choosing a product means that, for instance, I choose an element, like choose a product Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5. And then, for instance, um, I have three plus two multi-curves. And then what this is saying then, apply twist about the first curve and apply twist about the second and third and fourth and fifth. But then if I'm choosing, if, I'm, if, if I change my A and B to different ones, I can use the same recipe, first one, second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one. Um, so I have the same recipe for the product, but I'm choo choosing the underlying curves differently. Um, so now I'm, I'm trying to explain why this is a sort of natural choice for choosing sequences. Um, <coughs> all right. So, uh, so, um, So I'm going to make this, this situation in this board a little bit more abstract. So, so I define x uh, to be, in this case, uh, uh, the set of 3 by 2 matrices. Uh, it's going to be the space of, space of intersection matrices. So this, this x is, a, is an element of, of the space of all intersection matrices. So this choosing A and B corresponds to uh, choosing some x in this space. And so notice that, that omega is a function of x. So qi are also functions of x. So omega, so whenever I want to denote something as a function, I'm going to underline it. So omega is a function of x, and qi is also a function of x. So actually, this monoid is also a function of x, where I'm using this qi, this matrix qi constructed from x. Um, so in fact, I can think of um, these, these qi as functions on the space x. So here's a picture. So this is my two degrees of freedom. Um, so this, this coordinate is, is x. So I can choose an intersection matrix. And, and, and this is uh, the, the space of 5 by 5 matrices. So, so for instance, q1. This Q1 assigns to each x some 5 by 5 matrix. So this Q1 is a function on this space x. Uh, also Q2 is also, and also every product of these guys is, is also some function. Um, so, um, so now, if I fixed my pair of multi-curves and vary the product, that would correspond to fixing a point here and vary my function and look at all these points, which, is, uh, which certainly seems less natural than fixing one function and just moving this point in this space. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix such an, such, a, such an element, such a function, and I'm going to move this x somehow in this space. 
and I'm looking at, well, if I plug x into this function, I get a sequence of matrices, and I'm going to understand what, what happens with those sequence of matrices. OK? <coughs> right, so. Um, So um, you can also draw a similar picture when uh, you have this, which is a matrix value function, and you can you can compose it with uh, with a function lambda, which which picks out the pair of Fabian eigen value of that matrix. So that's also now not a matrix valued function, but some real valued function. So unfortunately, when when I take some sequence of these points x going to infinity, then uh, as, as these, uh, these pictures illustrate, the, the stretch factor is going to infinity. Well, intuitively, what this means is uh, I'm, I'm picking more and more complicated pair of multi-curves that intersects more and more times, but I'm just using the same recipe for the Daintree's product. So of course, I'm going to get more and more complicated pseudo Nossett maps. But the, the, uh, the amazing thing is that if you choose the sequence of this, this sequence correctly and, and this function correctly, and if you look at not lambda but all the middle eigenvalues, all the Galois conjugates of lambda, then they will converge. So, so that's what uh, I'll, I'll try to formalize a little bit. So, so given a matrix M, this WM is uh, going to be the codimension two subspace, well, codimension two invariant subspace of M. Um, Corresponding to uh, the eigenvalues other than lambda, uh, lambda m, and one over lambda m. So it's just the it's just the subspace spanned by all the eigenvectors corresponding to the Galois conjugates of lambda. It's a it's some codimension to subspace, and f m is going to be the. Yeah. So m. So here m is just uh, m is just a matrix. Uh, it's uh, it's it's some square matrix. So um, you should think of m as an element of. Of one of these pen and one mono eights. So M is some product of this QI. So if it's a Perron-Frobenius matrix, then lambda M is its Perron-Frobenius eigenvalue, and I can look at the this invariant space spanned by all these middle eigenvalues. And F M is going to be the the induced the, the induced map of F on this invariant subspace. So the the induced linear map uh, uh, induced linear map by M um, on this invariant subspace. Um, so The un underlining yeah. always just means that I just want to distinguish like this from this because this mean this means so underline something underline means it's a function it's a, it's a so if if I just say Q one it's it's a concrete matrix but if I say Q one underline it's a function on the space of intersection matrices. 
Um, any other uh, any other questions? It's not not more notation. Um, maybe just yeah. So okay. So m. So you should uh, you should think of m. Okay, think about m. Like m as an element of this, and think about m as a sort of general element where m can be written as a product of all the q qi's. So if you use all the qi's, then it's going to be parenthetic in use, and then this makes sense, and then this makes sense. All right. So. Um, all right. So, like I said, um, I want x to go to infinity. So I'm going to define what this means. Uh, so here is x. Well, x is nothing else than it's. Uh, well, x is a is a space of matrices uh, with non-negative entries. So it's uh, is the integral point in a positive cone. Uh, OK, so it's some positive cone. And uh, well, I just define the boundary of this positive cone by you know, the set of rays in the positive cone. So I have, I have this ideal boundary. And if I have a point uh, on this ideal boundary, then, um, then I can say that some points converge to to that point in the ideal boundary if the if, if the rays through those points converge okay so I'm going to take sequences that converge to the boundary in this way um, Right, so uh, given, given uh, some x star in the boundary, for instance, the ray of so we had this, uh, this matrix x here, so let's, let's think about the ray of, of this guy that's at some point on the boundary, and then we can draw a graph where, so if this is 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I'm connecting two numbers if the corresponding entry there is positive. So I connect the 1 with 5, 2 with both and then 3 with only 4. Um, so, I, so I already, so I told you how I want x to go to infinity. And I'm also going to explain now how you, how you should take this, this product, because this needs to be special. So the way we take this product is, um, we pick some gamma, which is a closed path. So let's, let's say this is G. Gamma is a closed path in G. For instance, this guy. Well, this graph is contractible, so uh, the set of closed paths is not, not very interesting. But given a closed path, say, I1, J1, IK, JK, um, I can define uh, a matrix product as QI1, QJ1, QIK, and QJK. OK, so every, every path corresponds to some, some element in, in gamma. And uh, I'm almost there to 
state the theorem. Um, So uh, um, so actually these Q ones, these QI are all functions on this space X. So this M gamma is also a function on that space. So I can compose this function well the well this, this function produces me some Perron Frobenius matrix. And I can compose this with this uh, W that picks up this middle invariant subspace. Uh, and this is W uh, gamma. And I can also I, I can also pick out this uh, action on this middle invariant subspace. And then um, Um, this is the last piece of motivation. Um, I define some subset of this ideal boundary um, which is compatible with gamma. Compatible means that, uh, well, gamma, which is, a, which is a path in this graph, uh, uh, traverses edges and and this is going to be the the subspace of uh, of the boundary where um, let me explain in a moment what this is So the, the support uh, so. okay, so so given X star, this is this is called the support of X star. So the support of X star is just those edges that that uh, where there is a non-zero non entry. And the support of gamma is is the edges uh, traversed by by gamma. So 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 this is some good subspace of the boundary where this X star has enough. Uh, non-zero entries. Okay, so if if it has non-zero entries at all the places where gamma traverses an edge, then it's a, it's a um, it's a good point. And then um, so here's the the theorem is that these omega gamma and F gamma, um, which are functions on the space X. So this one is some uh, vector space valued function, um, and this one is some linear math valued function. Uh, F functions on on the space X, and they extend continuously. To, uh, to this good boundary. All right, so, so what does that mean? So this means that um, if I'm taking a, a, a pair of multi-curves, and then more precisely, I'm taking a sequence of pairs of multi-curves, 
where the intersection matrices uh, um, sort of projectively uh, converge to array, and and the the uh, right they, they projectively converge to array, and if I write down my my matrix product in a good way, uh, then all my middle eigenvalues, all the Galois conjugates of lambda are going to stabilize and converge somewhere. Um, so then how do you get convergence to 1? Say it again. Yeah, so so the okay, so the word yeah, so the word first of all, the word so the word is this m m gamma. Okay, so the, first of all the word has to be alternating. So you have to you have to pick a day twist in A and then a day twist in B and then day twist in A and day twist in B, right? Because it's a path in this bipartite graph. So that's one thing. Um, but also, like I said, there is there's some way this this path needs to be compatible with with this matrix. Okay. Um, so um, so how do I get convergence of eigenvalues to one? Um, well, it turns out that. Um, the extensions of these functions to this boundary um, f gamma, so these restricted to the boundary, um, are invariant under homotopy. of gamma. So it means that, well, um, so changing gamma, even changing gamma somehow means that you're taking a different product. So if you change your path by homotopy to some really, really long, complicated path, then you're, of course, changing your pseudo and also, and you're changing, you're probably increasing the stretch factor, and you're changing everything. But this is saying that as long as you, you stay, stay in the same homotopy class, then in the limit, you get the same thing. So the stretch factors might be completely different, but when you, when you get the limit, the middle eigenvalues, all the Gala conjugates converge. So corollary of this is that if you take a contractible path, so if gamma is contractible, <coughs> then, uh, then this f gamma uh, is the identity is the identity map at all points in particular all the eigenvalues all the all the Galois conjugates converge to one All right. Um, are there any questions at this point? Yes. Uh, I was wondering. Uh, so X star is ray of that matrix, and so the support of X star is what all possible graph. No, the support is the graph. Well, so if you multiply this by a constant, the, the set of en the, the entries that are non-zero stay the same. So there's a well-defined graph obtained by, by 
drawing an edge if if in the corresponding entry there's a positive there's a positive number. So what's the support? Well the support of the matrix is just this graph. The that bipartite graph. So it's well it's supporting the positive entries, I guess. This is just a way to describe which entries of the matrix are positive. Um, um, what does it mean that so there was a condition before that each of the each of the rules should be used at least one if you wanted to get something? Yeah. Well, it's just you, you need to you, you need to uh, visit every vertex at least once, right? So you, you need to put all the all the QI in your product. But so if yeah, of course, yeah. Well, so yeah, you, you can yeah you can you can change it by homotopy and you get the same limit, but you can't contract it into a point because then it's not pseudo it's not perimphrobenius anymore right because then if you contract it to a point then you know nothing appears or one matrix appears so so these functions are not well defined um, but as long as you change it by homotopy in a way that that you go through all the vertices, then 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 the limit, then the extension is a homotopy invariant. So if we're checking so what does a homotopy of gamma mean? Oh it's just this combinatorial homotopy. So or So going from one to five back to one, that's yeah, trivial. Yeah, so you can think of it as a topological homotopy. If you 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 consider a path as an uh, as a as a map from zero one uh, in a way, and um, and you can consider it as a topological homotopy, you can you can change that map, or you can think of discrete these discrete steps of homotopy where you can add or remove these backtrackings. All right, so. Um, um, let me just say in the next few minutes what what is the limit. So, like what is what is what is this limit, and why is it invariant under gamma or under homotopy? Uh, there's some mystery here that I don't really understand. Um, so what happens is. Um, for instance, um, well, so my n gamma is is this this product, and then the the extension to uh, to the boundary is uh, is basically uh, described by some weird matrix product. Um, So it's I1 arrow J1, J1 arrow I2. So, right. So, what does this mean? Uh, so, uh, I have two um, coordinate planes. This is I1. I denote the axis by I1, I2, and, and, and the rest. Now, assume that k is just 2. And here, I denote the axis by the j's. 
J1 and J2. And then um, I have two lines here, J1 and J2. And here I have two lines uh, labeled by I1 and I2. And so what this is saying is, well, this is a projection on a line J1 in the direction of I1. So um, um, so it's like this one and, and every second of these matrices is a projection in 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 one side and all the all the other ones are projections um, in the other side. So what you do is you start from like I2 and uh, uh, it says project onto, well, okay, like here, project onto J, maybe we are here, project onto J1 in the direction of I1. So I'm projecting, projecting onto this one in the direction of I1. And then, um, I'm just following what these things are saying. And then I get some linear map of, on one of these lines. Um, so, and it turns out that if you change this path by a homotopy, or change, change this by backtracking, then what happens is you, you, just, you just change two of the matrices in this sequence of projections. Actually, you just add one projection on one side, and you add another projection on the other side. And the projection you add is something like, well, you're already projected on I2, and it's another projection on I2, so it doesn't do anything. Uh, so, uh, so it turns out that this sequence of projections will be a homotopy invariant. and. Uh, yeah, I know it's not very satisfying. It's <laughs> yeah, and that causes this to be a homotopy invariant as well. Yeah, I think I'll stop here. <laughs>